Hello, welcome to Mythology Monday. This is our first ever video version. Hope that you like it. If you do, be sure to let me know. If you don't, or if you think it could be improved, be sure to let me know that as well. I would love to know what I could do to make this video segment more entertaining, more watchable, and more educating to you all. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the afterlife myth that comes from the mosquito culture, which is culture that is located and has individuals that belong to the specific tribe in Honduras and Nicaragua. So in order for today's video to make a little bit more sense, I'll provide a very brief introduction to it. This myth revolves all around Nakali. Nakali is the person who the story, who we learn the story from as readers slash listeners, and he is a devoted husband and a loving father. That is what enables him to both go to the underworld and to successfully return from it, which is presumably how the Mosquito people who once believed in this myth and who still do believe in it, if any exist, learn about what happens in the afterlife and learn about the obstacles that are blocking someone's soul. It's the logical reasoning that they know about this myth rather than just say someone died and came back to life. So. Now, if you're ready, I hope that you'll stick with me for the rest of the video as we talk about the myth itself. The journey of Nakali and his wife began with his wife attempting to convince him not to go with her to the land of the dead. He is ultimately steadfast in his conviction, and he accompanies her. The very first obstacle that they come across is an obstacle that Nakali is able to save her from, which you would think becomes a recurring thing for the rest of the myth, but actually doesn't. What ends up happening is that they cross a narrow footpath, and at the end of this footpath they come across an area where there are birds of prey who are flying in the sky. Seeing these birds of prey spreads fear into Nakali's wife, and Nakali has to step in and scare off the birds of prey, convincing them to leave through intimidation before they are able to continue. This is a very interesting moment because at a moment like this, generally what would happen is a moment that becomes a pattern for the rest of the myth, but that's not the case because in the rest of the obstacles, Nakali's wife is able to do everything the orthodox way and Nakali has to do everything in more indirect or in ways that obviously weren't the typical intention. And it's generally because of his size. The next obstacle that they come across is they come across an area where there are two trees located extremely close to each other. This area was probably meant to represent the most direct way to get to the land of the dead. But what ends up happening is that Nakali's wife is able to just walk through the two trees because there's a tiny bit of space that allows for the soul of someone to move past them directly, but Nakali himself has to go around them. Him, his size makes these obstacles different for him than they would be for her, and they also make his solutions different, which show both Nakali's cleverness as a protagonist and his sort of lack of knowledge of the area that they're going through. Either that or there's an unspoken acceptance of the sort of obstacles that he himself will have to navigate across. The very next obstacle that happens is the penultimate one, and what ends up happening is they come across an area where there's a gap. There is a pot of boiling water beneath this gap, and there is a very, very thin bridge that only the souls of the dead should be able to get through. And what ends up happening is that Nakali's wife walks over this bridge, and Nakali himself decides to jump the gap. Because even though the gap is massive, it's only massive in the context of someone who is not the proper size to get through it. Nakali is able to clear the gap with one jump. They are able to safely proceed past the pot of boiling water, which could have otherwise spelled their doom. The final direct obstacle in their path is a massive river. This massive river is able to typically only be crossed by the souls of the worthy dead. And what happens is the souls of the worthy dead are canoed across this river on boats paddled by toads. And those who are unworthy get in the canoes and then partway across the canoes tip over. 
The reason why this is a bad fate is that it's in this moment that sardines, which to the souls are so massive that they look like sharks, appear as if out of nowhere and devour them. And of course this is a frightening deterrent to anyone unworthy who's trying to cross, but since they're sardines, they don't represent a threat to Nakali. While Nakali's wife is able to get across in the typical way, Nakali himself, being of his size, isn't able to fit on the canoes paddled by toads and has to swim across. The sardines pose no threat to him as a person of presumably normal stature, and he is able to safely cross. And it's in this moment that they reach the land where they are free to do whatever they want. At least, if Nakali can manage to surpass one final obstacle. Nakali and his wife have successfully made it to the land of the dead. The very first thing that happens is that they are greeted by a strange woman, quite possibly a goddess or a spirit, named Masala. Masala is presumably the guardian of the land of the dead, and she is displeased that Nakali has made it. Seeing Nakali, she orders him to leave, and Nakali refuses to do so. He eventually manages to persuade her that he should be allowed to remain with his wife. And while she isn't particularly happy about this, she allows them to stay. What ends up happening is that after an undisclosed amount of time in this idyllic, carefree paradise where there is no poverty, where there is no famine, and where there is no disease, Nakli begins to miss his children. He decides that he needs to go back to them, and he goes to speak to Masala. Masala agrees to send him back and informs him that he'll be able to return, but only when he dies. Which is what's supposed to happen. It's the natural order of things. So Masala sets Nakali on a stalk of bamboo in the version of the myth that I read, obviously. And she sets the bamboo on a river. The river eventually flows out into the ocean, and in the ocean Nakali is hit by a massive wave, which causes him to float, possibly unconsciously, to where he's from, back to the home of himself and his children. And at some point in the future, I would assume Nakali inevitably perishes, quite sadly, and is able to be reunited with his wife. But the logical reason and the logical purpose of this myth is to explain what a specific culture thinks happens in the afterlife. I think that this was a very interesting way to do it. I think that this was also a very romantic way to do it by making it so that a man and the person that the man loved go to the afterlife together, and eventually the man returns because he loves his family. Nakali is presumably portrayed very positively in oral versions of the Smith, although I read a textual version of it, which doesn't go a whole lot into his character, aside from mentioning the fact that he loves his wife very much and that he wanted to be with her. I really enjoy this myth, and if you are interested in hearing more about Mythology Mondays as a video segment, I suggest that you continue watching this video for just a little bit longer. Back before I started blogging in a professional capacity, I started a series named Mythology Mondays, and in it, on Mondays, I would go in and I would talk about interesting and under-discussed creatures, gods, and myths from all over the world. Eventually, this focus transformed into a more narrow, but also generally better written thing called Mythology Mondays Latin America. And this version of it would appear on both my personal Facebook page, the Secular Latino Alliance, which is a Facebook group meant to provide a community for Hispanic non-believers, and eventually Freethought Blog's The Hispanic Atheist, and then Patheos' Sin God blog. Now, obviously, it's very interesting that an atheist is taking time to research and discuss myths, but as a young child, it was my passion for myths that informed my decision to get interested in history, and eventually what led me down the road to atheism. I also find myths very interesting, and I want to take time to discuss them intelligently, compassionately, and skeptically. And I think that talking about them in this way opens up the conversation to make it more easily possible for people of various religious beliefs to talk about these myths in analytical and intelligent ways. 
And while on these videos I am going to be talking about the myths themselves, I am going to be narrating the events, I am not going to just release a video. With each one of these, I also intend to make a Patheos post, including for topics that I've already covered, but in these Patheos posts, which I am also going to be sharing in the descriptions of the videos once the posts have been published, I want to take time to intelligently talk about the lo logical reasons that these myths exist and what they tell us about a culture. So I think that it's very neat that I'm starting this up again. I hope that you agree. And if you want to see more, do the obvious YouTube thing. You know, like, comment, subscribe. And I definitely think that this is a video series that especially as I improve as a video maker as a, and as a presenter has the potential to attract lots of people and to result in lots of very intelligent, hopefully compassionate and analytical discussions about mythologies, about religious beliefs, and about how we can discuss these in ways that are not just making fun of them and in ways that aren't just mindlessly believing that they're true or that another culture's mythologies, beliefs, and religions are true as well. I hope that you have a great day and be sure to let me know what you thought of this in the comment section down below.